Hi, everyone, and welcome to the NCAT webinar, Payments for Ecosystem Services. My name is Colin Mitchell, and I'm a Sustainable Agriculture Specialist at the National Center for Appropriate Technology, which, to be honest, is kind of a mouthful, so most people just know us as NCAT. Oh, sorry about that, everybody. So I work out of our Southwest office in San Antonio, Texas. NCAT is a nationwide nonprofit organization established in 1976 that has six regional offices across the country, Arkansas, Mississippi, California, New Hampshire, and Texas with our headquarters in Montana. Also, we have some other, other staff in other states such as Pennsylvania, Virginia, and Colorado. We work on issues pertaining to sustainable agriculture, sustainable energy, and sustainable communities. So a little about me. Again, my name is Colin Mitchell. I earned a Bachelor of Arts in Government with a specialization in Geography and the Environment at the University of Texas at Austin, completed a 10-month project management internship at the Permaculture Research Institute of Australia, and have managed sustainable agriculture projects in Central Texas and the Western United States, focusing on permaculture design, intensive livestock grazing, agroforestry, per perennial polyculture food systems, organic row crops, and using landscape earthworks to increase water availability. Now I work for NCAT on many of the same topics, but focusing on farmer and rancher education, providing a technical assistance to farmer and ranchers, and developing sustainable and regenerative agriculture solutions. My expertise is now expanded to economic tools for funding sustainable agriculture operations, including today's topic. So I want to give a thank you to NCAT, ATRA, and our IT staff at NCAT for making this all possible. Also, I want to give a special thank you to Southern Sustainable Agriculture and Research, also known as Southern SARE, and Dr. Barbara Bellows of Tarleton State and the Texas Institute of Applied Environmental Research. This presentation is part of a Southern SARE grant project focused on carbon sequestration, soil health, and payments for ecosystem services that I and others at NCAT have been working with Dr. Bellows on. This webinar is part one of a three-part webinar series. The second part will be at 11.45 a.m. Central Standard Time, so that's Texas time, on Thursday, August 6th. It will cover carbon markets and stacked payment programs, and we will have two guest presenters and Debbie Reed, the Executive Director of the Ecosystem Service Market Consortium, and Jim Blackburn of Rice University's Baker Institute. If you're signed up for the newsletter, you will be receiving a registration link for that webinar. You will also receive a follow-up email tomorrow with links to this recorded webinar, and that email will provide you with a link to the August 6th webinar. So this webinar is being recorded and will be available on NCAT's ATRA webpage and on our YouTube channel. ATRA, our Sustainable Agriculture Program, is funded through a cooperative agreement with the USDA Rural Business Cooperative Service, and we're, we are grateful for their support as well. So ATRA offers a wide range of services to sustainable ag producers, including publications, toll-free helplines, and webinars. You can check it out for yourself after the webinar on the ATRA website, www.atra.ncat.org. If you have technical questions, don't ever hesitate to call us at 1-800-346-9140 or shoot us an email at askanag at ncat.org, and you can see those at the bottom of the screen. So there are a couple of other things I'd like to point out before we get started. First, you'll see a question field on the screen where you can write questions during the webinar. We will be collecting the questions and we will answer a number of them towards the end of the webinar. Do not be shy about asking questions. If you ask a question and it is not answered during the webinar, we will answer it and all the questions we get via email in the days to come. In fact, if you think of questions after the webinar or about any sustainable agriculture question, look for the Ask and Ag expert contact information on the actual website or take down that number and email at the bottom of your screen. Also, at the end of the webinar, you'll receive a short survey. Please take a few minutes to answer the survey. It helps us make future webinars as effective and helpful as we can. So let's start with the basics. Ecosystem services are ecological characteristics, functions, or processes that directly or indirectly contribute to human well-being. Ecosystem services are the benefits society derives from functioning ecosystems. And all society relies on these ecosystem processes operating the way they're supposed to. And this is true of sustainable agriculture production. Sustainable agriculture relies on vital ecolog ecological interactions. 
Ecosystem services can be broken out down into four different main categories, provisioning, regulating, cultural, and supporting services. Provisioning services are material or energy outputs from ecosystems and include food, raw materials, and more. So y'all farmer and ranchers, y'all are already doing that. Regulating services are services that come from the regulation of ecosystem processes and include water, for, water, pur uh, water purification, air quality, pollination, and more. Cultural services are non-material things that benefit society, such as recreation, cultural identity, and aesthetic value. Supporting services come from having living spaces for plants and animals and the maintenance of biodiversity, which are the foundation of all ecosystems and their services. Supporting services include water and nutrient cycling, soil formation, photosynthesis, and more. So this slide shows examples of the several types of ecosystem services. And when you read through them, it is apparent these different services directly or indirectly contribute to our personal and community well-being. And this very much holds true for sustainable agriculture. It will be difficult to grow row crops or raise livestock on pasture without the properly functioning processes of carbon sequestration, water pollution control, the water cycle, pollination, nutrient cycling and soil fertility, or pest and disease management. Those things are all integral to a healthy, functioning, sustainable agriculture system. So agriculture is often known as a major polluter and destroyer of ecosystem services. However, with sustainable or regenerative management practices, agriculture can improve carbon sequestration, water quality, soil water holding capacity, water infiltration, air quality, and wildlife habitat, all while producing food and timber compared to the many of the industrialized agriculture practices we see. So these are some of the practices that can improve ecosystem services, especially those ecosystem services that derive from a healthy soil. These sustainable practices include crop rotation and cover crops, minimizing disturbance, so that's minimum or no-till, adaptive multi paddock grazing, which is you move your cows really frequently. You, sometimes you have them in smaller paddocks and move them almost every day. Um, that is going to be a little bit adaptive depending on season and weather and different things like that. Agroforestry practices and riparian protection. Riparian protection. Crop diversity can also assist with disease and pest prevention, and pollinator buffers can increase habitat for bees, butterflies, and other pollinators and beneficial insects as well. So while it may be easy to say, hey, go implement these sustainable or regenerative management practices and we'll create a cleaner environment all while producing food, the reality of widespread farmer and rancher adoption of these practices is much more challenging. The startup costs for new sustainable farmers and the cost of transitioning can be burdensome. Often these practices require new equipment. Also, there may be a pro productivity dip if you were using lots of fertilizers and you're waiting for your soil health to increase and nitrogen, phosphorus, and other nutrients and minerals to become more bioavailable as the natural processes of the soil food web are restored. This dip in production would lead to less income. Also, farmers and ranchers need time and money for education on new practices, and it will take time and feedback over a few years to become proficient at a new practice. It's not going to go, it's not going to be go to one class and then you're an expert. Also, the, the investment required to adopt new practices may not be worth it for folks renting land. This is especially true in adding perennial elements, perennial elements to a farm or ranch like silver pasture or alley cropping. And finally, there is limited research-based information on locally adapted practices, though this is increasing. Personally, I've seen lots of broad recommendations about cover crop use and termina termination that works for lots of you all over the country. And I have seen it firsthand, those recommendations fail in the lower Rio Grande Valley here in Texas, where it is often above 100 degrees, sometimes 110, in the summer, in the summer and the average annual rainfall is 15 to 17 inches, depending on the year. All of these, reasons are why there has been increased interest in putting a value on ecosystem services and paying farmers and ranchers to improve or maintain ecosystem services by adopting sustainable or regenerative practices. In the 70s, 80s, and 90s, the detrimental effects of the Green Revolution to our natural capital and the functioning of ecosystems became apparent. In the late 90s, a group published an article in Nature putting a monetary value on ecosystem services. They came up with an average of $33 trillion per year. 
And to see how management affects multiple ecosystem services, let's take a typical high tillage monocrop system that uses a lot of chemical fertilizer as an example. This system leads to soil erosion, less water inf infiltration, so more irrigation needed, less biodiversity and wildlife habitat, algae blooms and bodies of water from fertilizers, which decreases fish populations and aquatic biodiversity, and then increases the cost of purified water in suburban and urban areas downstream. It's pretty apparent all of these ecosystems are connected. Any practice done on a farm is not done in isolation. And this type of degradation costs money to fix, whether it is a water treatment plant, implementing erosion control structures, or dealing with destruction um, that comes from climate change with increased fires and weather severity. And so there has actually been some pushback on putting a dollar value on the environment and these ecosystem services. One reason is that the environment, ecosystem function, and ecosystem services are so inherently valuable that putting in a price on them may come off as a disservice. They are valuable beyond a monetary designation, that they should be protected and conserved because it's the right thing to do. Another argument against putting a price on ecosystem services is the fear that we may be treating nature as a service provider similar to a cable company. So out of sustainable or regenerative agriculture's ability to improve ecosystem service, improve ecosystem services, programs have been developed to reward farmers and ranchers for their improvement or maintenance of ecosystem services. Typically, farmers and ranchers can be paid for sequestering carbon, improving water quality and other various hydrological functions. Also, agriculture producers can be rewarded for the conservation of habitat for endangered species and pollinators and the protection of landscapes through erosion controls, tree planting, riparian protection, and more. So these are the four main types of payment for ecosystem service programs are available. You have direct payment programs, which includes cost shares, tax incentives, certification programs, and ecosystem service markets are the four main broad categories. Each is distinct and we will be discussing how each of them can provide payments to farmers and ranchers for maintaining or improving ecosystem services. Direct payment programs involve some version of a scenario where the buyer is paying farmers and ranchers directly for implementing some sort of management practice. The practice specifics are laid out in a described best management practice that are designed to meet specific environmental protections. In direct payment programs, you would, will typically have to sign a contract saying that you will adhere to the best management practices and scope and location of work. In most cases, the environmental improvement will not be measured, so this is why a contract is used to ensure environmental improvements through practice adoption. So one of the most notable direct payment programs are cost shares from the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service, or NRCS. There are two main types of direct payment programs in the NRCS. The first is the Environmental Qualities Incentives Program, often called EQIP. This program provides financial and technical assistance to agricultural producers to address natural resource concerns and deliver environmental benefits such as improved water and air quality, conserve ground and surface water, increase soil health and reduce soil erosion and sedimentation, improved or created wildlife habitat, and mitigation increasing weather volatility. The Conservation Stewardship Program, or CSP, helps farmers and ranchers build on existing conservation efforts while strengthening, strengthening their operation. NRCS helps identify natural resource problems in an operation and provide technical and financial assistance to solve those problems or attain higher stewardship levels in an environmentally beneficial and cost-effective manner. The way we typically think of it is that EQIP is for brand new practice adoption like cover crops, or implementation or some uh, implementation of some sort of feature like a pond or cross fencing or you know a, a um, riparian buffer and then csp participants must meet a stewardship threshold for a set number of priority resource concerns when they apply for the program <coughs> then they must agree to meet or exceed the stewardship threshold for additional priority resource concerns by the end of the five-year contract in exchange, in exchange participants receive annual payments that are based in part on the performance of their conservation initiatives. The minimum payment for all successful applicants is $1,500. Both programs feature shorter contracts, typically less than five years, and both programs rely on NRCS practice standard, standards, which are like a best management practice for conservation measures. Typically, funding is allocated depending on the conservation priority of your region, 
and money does run out and acquiring funding through one of these programs is not guaranteed every single year. Another type of direct payment program that is regional is the New York City Watershed Agricultural Program. New York City obtains 90% of its drinking water from reservoirs in the Catskill, Delaware watershed, located more than 100 miles from the city. The remainder of the water comes from the Croton watershed, located just north of the metropolitan area. Together, these watersheds cover 2,000 square miles. In 1992, the New York City Department of Environmental Protection, the department that manages the city's water supply, developed a partnership with the farming community in the Catskill, Delaware, and Croton watersheds. The program's aim is to minimize agricultural runoff pollutants, including sediment, nutrients, and pathogens. Reducing these pollutants will help the city avoid installing expensive water treatment facilities for New York City's drinking water. Runoff pollutants are reduced by farmers working with the Watershed Agricultural Program, facilitated by the nonprofit Watershed Agricultural Council. Through creation and implementation of voluntary pollution reduction plans called whole farm plans. Each whole farm plan is developed by an interdisciplinary team of professionals, including the farmer, which is really important, based on a comprehensive environmental review of the farm's current and potential pollution problem. The plans recommend NRCS developed best management practices specific to each farm's environment and operation that address current and future sources of pollution. To pay for implementation of these best management practices, the New York City Department of Environmental Protection provides the farmers with technical and financial assistance. In the Catskill, Delaware watershed, 100% of the cost to create and implement the plan is covered, while in the Croton watershed, farmers usually contribute half of the cost to create and implement the farm plans. In some cases, the NRCS covers some of these costs as part of the EQIP program we just mentioned. And as of 2019, 90% of the farms on these watersheds are participating in the program with approximately 400 whole farm plans and more than 5,000 best management practices implemented on large and small scale commercial farms. In addition to these direct payments, the Watershed Agriculture Council has bought forest and farmland easements, which we will discuss here in a minute, on more than 25,000 acres to conserve and monitor working lands for the future. So, how do these direct payment programs benefit farmers and ranchers if they are short-term contracts and only paying for all or part of practice implementation? Well, for one, they can provide relief from regulations. So they have this scenario instead of a farmer or rancher who may have to pay a tax on herbicides, pesticides, and fertilizer and soil running off the farm and into a waterway, the farmer can have part or all of some of, some of the conservation practices paid that will mitigate these pollutants let their farmer or, or rancher avoid paying a regulation tax. These direct payment programs can also provide soil protection, which will lead to longer term production gains through the increase of nutrient cycling, water holding capacity, water infiltration rates, and more. Also, there are socio environmental benefits such as the increased wildlife habitat and overall water quality of a stream that comes from a practice like a riparian buffer. While most of the contract will go to practice adoption, you can see long term economic gains and the strengthening of on-farm ecosystem services that lead to increased yields, less reliance on fertilizers, pesticides, and herbicides, and a system that is more resilient to extreme weather patterns like flood and drought. So next are tax incentives, which we're just going to cover briefly. And um, these are typically in the form of conservation easements, which provide landowners with a tax break for blocking off either part or all of their property to be conserved. Typically, the landowner is audited by the IRS, and there is an intermediate group to verify the conservation agreement is being upheld. Some easements allow for the landowner to continue to farm a ranch. Others do not and will not allow you to continue, continue to farm a ranch. And there are different easement types for different types of protections, whether it's water quality or protecting from fragmentation of farmland. And these property tax savings are not always guaranteed. So that's something to be wary of. A great example of an organization that holds working land easements here in Texas is the Texas Agricultural Land Trust. And also sometimes you receive a tax incident for just being a farmer rancher like you do in here in Texas. We call it the, the ag exemption is what it's known as just common speak here. So the third type of ecosystem service payment program is certification programs. 
Certification programs allow the farmer or rancher to be able to sell their product for a higher price point, and you get to slap a label on their product as their form of ecosystem service payment. Examples of this are USDA organic or the regenerative organic label. Often these programs cost money to be certified, but in some cases you can receive a cost share reimbursement. Another example is the new certification from the Audubon um, Society for beef raised on Audubon certified bird friendly land. Audubon helps the rancher develop bird friendly grazing protocols, provide technical assistance to the rancher, develop market opportunities and more. The rancher has to, to develop habitat management plans with an Audubon range ecologist, meet annual habitat requirements and standards, and then the rancher is able to sell their product with the Audubon label on it and participate in their marketing program. So the fourth type of ecosystem service payment program is ecosystem service markets, which use free market tools to create a marketplace where ecosystem service credits can be bought or sold and this is the area gaining tons of attention right now. Typically, ecosystem service markets have these factors. Credits are created, valued, and exchanged. There is a buyer and a seller of credits. There is a middle coordinating organization. Detrimental and beneficial environmental impacts are defined. There is assessment criteria and a verification process to ensure that there is an actual positive environmental impact and that value is being created and there is a process to, process to determine the price of the ecosystem service provided. And we have four main types of markets, carbon, water quality, wetland conservation bundling, which I'm kind of just grouping into one for now, and comprehensive programs. We're going to start with carbon markets, but I do want to note that there are also other types of greenhouse gas related programs focused on methane. These methane reduction programs typically are centered around rice production. Also, it is worth noting that you may have heard of one of the failed carbon markets, and that's the Chicago Climate Exchange that lasted from 2003 to 2011. It collapsed because the price of carbon dropped to a nickel because there were too many sellers and not enough buyers. So with the climate crisis at hand, carbon markets have been receiving lots of attention as a possible method to mitigate global warming through the sequestration of carbon through agricultural methods. There are different types of buyers when it comes to all ecosystem service markets. And it's an important distinction. Cap and trade is one type of market, which for carbon markets means the government creates a limit on the amount of carbon an entity can pollute and requires them either to pay tax to the government to offset their excess emission and then credits are sold by the government or credits are sold through an interme intermediary. Another option is for the polluter to buy carbon credits on their own through a market of their choosing that matches the value of the emissions over the cap. Often these are referred to as offsets. These entities are paying to offset their pollution over the cap. Currently, carbon is being priced through cap and trade by California and in the Re Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, which is a group of states in the Northeast. In June, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative sold 16.3 million metric tons of carbon at $5.75 a metric ton. And earlier this year, California teamed up with Quebec and sold 8.6 million metric tons at $17.87 per metric ton. So the other type of buyer is a voluntary buyer of carbon credits. This is a company or government choosing to cap themselves and meet sustainability goals they have set for themselves. Companies setting internal goals for emissions reduction is increasingly common, though many prove to be toothless. Offset, offset markets have come under scrutiny because the pollution is still happening. And instead of reducing both agricultural and industrial carbon emissions, we are just reducing agricultural. This holds true for all ecosystem service markets with offsets like water quality trading. So agriculture can contribute to the reduction of greenhouse get greenhouse gases and attribute to climate change mitigation in a few ways. Carbon sequestration in trees and soil are the main avenues to agricultural's, agriculture's role in climate mitigation through, though as mentioned earlier, methane reduction in rice fields and methane reduction in cattle by feeding them odd things like lemongrass or orange peel also have been receiving attention. So there are many issues with carbon markets for agricultural producers. One of them is known as permanence, or the requirement that all carbon sequestered, whether in trees or soils, 
be permanent. This is reflected in many of the contracts that are created with landowners participating in these markets. Almost all of these contracts are over 10 years, some of them reaching 50 years and over. Permanence creates problems for those leasing properties and those that may not pass down their land. Also, permanence is an issue because of occurrences of fires and floods that may destroy carbon stocks in soils and trees, which will increase with global warming. Another issue in carbon markets is additionality, meaning that carbon must be new, and farmers and ranchers that have already been sequestering carbon by building soil and planting trees won't be eligible for payments. In some cases, additionality prevents landowners from receiving ecosystem service payments from other sources, like an easement or an NRCS program. Also, there are issues around the uncertainty of measurements. Depending on what time of year you take soil samples, the bulk density and the organic matter, which are two major measurement standards, may be different. There's also an issue with testing depth. Are soil samples being taken at six inches, 12 inches, or is a soil sample being taken to a few feet? Often, carbon is sequestered in deeper soil profiles. Increasingly, remote sensing and models are being used to generate values of carbon sequestration on farms. Models such as Comet Farm from NRCS would only provide estimates that likely won't be accurate enough for a carbon market. Remote sensing uses biometrics taken from satellites that are often ground truth with soil samples and other measurements. Remote sensing has issues of modeling errors and can rely on extrapolating assumptions from a smaller area to larger swaths of land to calculate whole farm carbon sequestration that could lead to inaccuracies. And geography is also an issue on farm and nationally. A slope will have a different carbon sequestration potential than a flat in a valley. And even different pastures will have different levels of sequestered carbon. And how can we compare the carbon sequestration potential between us here in Texas, where in the summertime materials from cover crops and other plant material used to feed soil microbes that create sequestered carbon burns off rapidly compared to those of you in the Northeast who have more moderate climates and regular more rainfall? Is our rate of improvement and carbon sequestration ceiling the same? And the last kind of major issue is greenwashing. And this is essentially companies putting spin on agriculture-based carbon markets. They're slapping their brand on an initiative and calling it a day, you know, we're sustainable now, let's go home. Carbon sequestration in soils is incredibly nuanced and could take lots of time to develop carbon stocks depending on several factors. Are companies footing the bill and claiming sustainability actually paying for farmer and rancher education and practice adoption to sequester carbon? And are these agricultural methods to sequester carbon actually a primary tool in mitigating climate change, or are they a smaller, more specialized tool, and our primary goal of carbon emission reductions should remain with the fossil fuel sector? So next is water quality markets. And they perform in a similar fashion to carbon markets. There are cap and trade markets and voluntary ones. With the capped market, this authority typically comes from the Clean Water Act, and puts a limit on temperature, sediment, or pollutants like nitrogen and phosphate in larger bodies of water like rivers and lakes, and ultimately like the uh, like bays and gulfs and things like that. Uh, this pollution cap is often referred to as total maximum daily load or TMDL. TMDL comes in two forms, point source pollution, which could be from a pipe, ditch, or other direct source, and non-point source pollution, which would include farmers because it comes from across the landscape. So think of manure or uh, fertilizer running off your farm or ranch. Um, and they both can be capped, but typically point source polluters are buying credits from non-point source polluters for reductions. Point source polluters could be a large corporation or even a port authority. The Chesapeake Bay Regional Water Quality Trading Program and the Great Miami River Watershed Water Quality Credit Trading Program are two examples of these regulatory markets, and we're gonna touch on both briefly. The Chesapeake Bay, a major tourist and shell fishing location, has a large watershed that covers 64,000 square miles in parts of Maryland, Virginia, Pennsylvania, Delaware, New York, West Virginia, and the District of Columbia. When the six states in the district asked the EPA to establish a multi-state total maximum daily load under the Clean, Clean Water Act in 2010 and assign each of state its fair share, they took on the job of reducing discharges of nitrogen from all sources by 25%, phosphorus by 24% and sediment by 10%. Each state was allocated different TMDLs, the states with the largest share of Chesapeake Bay pollution and the greatest need to meet these TMDL reductions, Maryland, Pennsylvania, and Virginia implemented water quality trading programs. Each state is in charge of the creation and regulation of its own 
public water quality trading market. Also, each state's water quality trading program is semi-regulatory in its interaction with farmers because it requires regulated facilities, including farms, wastewater treatment facilities, and city stormwater runoff in the watershed to reduce pollutants a certain amount so that each state can meet its TMDL requirement. Farmers and ranchers, however, have the ability in some cases to reduce pollution more than is legally required through conservation practices. Any reductions met through the implementation of management practices practices that exceed farmers and ranchers TMDL baseline requirement are sold as credits to other businesses, facilities, and local municipalities. So that overall reduction requirements are met. Trading allowed, so trading allows regulated polluters to meet the legal requirements and defray the cost of compliance through purchase credits while still reducing the amount of pollution entering the watershed overall. For many regulated pol polluters, it is cheaper to buy these credits from farmers and ranchers than to meet their TMDL than to pay outright for technology and upgrades to meet TMDLs. So corporations and government bodies in the Chesapeake Bay region also support the adoption of farm invest management practices by supporting the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. These groups include the Hershey Company, Lockheed Martin, the Port of Virginia, and more. And they support the Chesapeake Bay water quality trading efforts through the Chesapeake Bay Foundation's advocacy, outreach, education, and technical assistance. The Chesapeake Bay Foundation provides support to farmers and ranchers looking to adopt conservation practices and enroll in their state's water quality trading. Two such programs are the Mountains to Bay Grazing Alliance and the Headwaters Agricultural Stewardship Project. The Mountains to Bay Grazing Alliance brings together private and public partners to promote the implementation of rotational grazing and related conservation practices and to increase the number of pasture-based livestock op operations in the Bay watershed portions of Virginia, Maryland, and Pennsylvania. The pro program connects current and new grazers provide, by providing outreach and technical assistance in the form of farmer-to-farmer -farmer mentoring, on-farm demonstrations, and other peer-to-peer -peer experiences. The Headwaters Agricultural Stewardship Project works with farmers and ranchers in Virginia's Shenandoah Valley to install conservation measures and best management practices that improve water quality, and that includes fencing out cattle out of streams, planting native riparian buffers, and adopting rotational grazing. So the Great Miami River Watershed Water Quality Credit Trading Program was developed in 2005 and serves the Great Miami Watershed in southwestern Ohio. This program involves both point source wastewater treatment facilities and non-point source farms and ranches as potential sources of water pollution. Agricultural operations installing conservation practices to reduce water pollution obtain funding through local soil and water conservation districts. District personnel then work with farmers to implement conservation practices on farms. The American Farmland Trust, a national nonprofit organization, helps to coordinate farmer involvement in this project and facilitate farmer ability to implement appropriate conservation practices. In its 2019 annual report, the Miami Conservation District described the cost effectiveness, cost effectiveness of this program by estimating that on average, point sources would pay $23.37 per pound to reduce phosphorus with biological nutrient removal. And that compares to the $1.08 per pound for agriculture um, to reduce phosphorus with conservation practices. For nitrogen, point source units costs were $4.72 per pound compared to the 45 cents per pound for agriculture. For more lessons about this program, be sure to tune into the third part of this webinar series, which is on August 27th, where Brian Brandt of the American Farmland Trust will be discussing the lessons learned from this trading program. So conservation and wetland mitigation banking are another type of market where you can have voluntary programs or regulated programs. These regulatory offset programs are essentially market programs where a polluter, such as a new development, a mine, or a transportation department may be destroying animal habitat or wetlands and are required either by the Clean Water Act or the Endangered Species Act or other like local and regional laws to have wetlands or habitat conserved or created on another property to offset the damage they are doing. NRCS has funding for wetland mitigation banking and much of the time you will work with US Fish and Wildlife for conservation banking for habitat creation and protection for endangered and other species. 
often land trusts that focus on working with uh, agricultural lands can help facilitate these opportunities. And the final type of markets are comprehensive markets. These comprehensive markets focused on stacking and bundling credits, um, which allow credit sellers to receive payment from multiple ecosystem services at once. So a farmer or rancher could potentially receive payment for water quality, habit protect, habitat protection, and carbon credits all at the same time. And this would be a more holistic approach and a more accurate representation of what sustainable or regenerative agriculture practices can achieve. And it could open the door for more small farmer, more small farm and ranch participation. So there are two main ecosystem service markets emerging and receiving lots of attention. The Ecosystem Service Market Consortium, or ESMC, is a new group with folks like McDonald's, General Mills, Cargill, Bayer, American Farm Bureau, National Fish and Wildlife, and tons of other companies and organizations involved. They've been working with the Noble Research Institute and have pilots in northern Texas, southern Oklahoma, and Kansas for rangeland and row crops and are seeking to expand. The goal of the ESMC is to start with a carbon market with aims to expand to include opportunities for water quality trading and wetland and conservation banking, and they want to be a, na a nationwide program. This would make the ES ESMC a program that would allow stacked payments for multiple ecosystems, from stacked payments from multiple sources, like we just mentioned. From my conversations with folks at the Noble Research Institute, the ESMC will be looking to mitigate the, initial, uh, mitigate the additionality issue by providing three years of back pay on sequestered carbon by using models. So if you've already been doing you know, sustainable ag practices and building up your soil, you'd be able to get three years of back pay versus a lot of programs where you get nothing. The ESM ESMC should start to launch in the next year. On part two of our webinar series, as I mentioned on August 6th, Debbie Reed, the executive director of the ESMC, will be presenting information about the market and where they, where they are with the pilot projects. The other emerging market is Indigo Ag, and it is a carbon market, carbon market focused around the Terraton Initiative, which is aiming to sequester 1 trillion tons of carbon. They're using biotech by providing microbial seed treatments and that they claim will help facilitate this carbon sequestration process and will be providing consulting services. They just kicked off a 10-year pilot, and there's a lot more to learn about this um, emerging carbon market as well. So emerging markets have marketing objectives that they hope will help them avoid the fate of the Chicago climate exchange and solve issues I mentioned before. These markets hope to allow farmers to be paid for environmental practices implemented prior to market involvement, reducing the negative effects additionality, just like I mentioned ESMC is trying to do. Also, some markets or those influencing emerging markets are, favor are arguing for farmers and ranchers to be able to receive payments from multiple sources. Ideally, you would be able to get a direct payment from NRCS's EQIP program, be organic certified, have a conservation easement, and receive payments for water quality credits and carbon credits from different sources if you're not enrolled in a comprehensive market. And there are indicators that the best way for these markets to succeed is to include payments for multiple ecosystem services. It's that stacked bundle approach, as this is the reality of sustainable and regenerative farming. You get multiple benefits from things like improving soil health, or installing a riparian buffer. Researchers are developing ways to reduce the costs of verifying and assessing environmental improvements through technology improvements and methods like soil testing, water quality testing, and remote sensing. So it's not so expensive for you to participate in these programs and you get more bang for your buck. This would make these markets more viable and less likely to collapse. Lastly, there is an indication that some markets could allow for aggregation. This would allow a group of farmers, say in a co-op or a watershed alliance, to combine the credits they generate and distribute the payment for those credits bought across members. This would produce more value than a loan and could increase small farmer and rancher um, participation. So finally, before jumping into one of these ecosystem service market programs, it's important to ask yourself some questions to determine, you know, is this right for you? Is this worth your time? Is this worth your effort? And we came up with a set of farmer recommendations um, that should be considered before enrolling. You know, is the program stable? We want farmers to avoid being enrolled in another potential Chicago climate exchange. 
I don't want farmers and ranchers enrolling in a carbon market that doesn't allow you to get NRCS payments for EQIP or CSP, and then you end up in a scenario where you foot the bill for adopting all these sustainable practices, and then the market collapses, and you never get any sort of, some any sort of payment. Are the required practices and verification processes clear? How many soil samples and when? What time of year? Make sure you get a verification timeline and a crystal clear explanation of the test being done on your property. Cost transparency. How much will all this monitoring cost? Is the farmer being paid for practice implementation or an environmental improvement that has to be measured? This will tell you if a if it's a market program, a direct payment program, or in some because in some cases you may be paid way more for a direct payment program. So it's important to figure out this difference. Are you the farmer getting a return on your investment? There may be no point in going through the hassle of the program if you're receiving enough just for a cup of coffee. And this was the case with some methane offset credits Microsoft bought from rice farmers in Arkansas as a pilot. How long until a farmer sees a return? Are you going to see improvements? Like as a farmer, you will see improvements to yields, or stocking density after a few years, but it could take years to receive a payment from an ecosystem service market, leaving a farmer or rancher responsible for the cost of transitioning to sustainable practices. Make sure to know when you do see improvements, how long it will take to get that money in your pocket. Is it 10 years? Is it three years? Can the credit be aggregated? Can you work with your co-op or your people on your watershed to generate credits and get payments? And at last, it's worth considering whether you should wait for these markets to evolve or not. You know, that you may not want to be the first one in your region on board, and you may want to wait to enroll um, in something like the Ecosystem Service Marketing Consortium until they're giving out stacked payments. You know, you have to figure out if that's right for you. If you're a larger farm, it may be no problem to be involved. If you're a smaller farm, it may take adding those stacked or bundled credits to get there. And so finally, we're just gonna wrap up with some resources for the group. Um, Dr. Barbara Bellows and I have co-authored an ATRA publication on this exact topic, if you would like something more in depth. Um, also, I am hosting a three-part webinar series that I mentioned coming up, and the second part will be on August 6th, and we'll cover carbon markets and credit stacking with Debbie Reed, the executive director of the ESMC, and Jim Blackburn, at Rice University's Baker Institute, who is co-leading a group to develop a new soil carbon sequestration verification standard. And it's not listed on here, but the third part is on August 27th, and will be on water quality trading and wetland and stream mitigation baking with Brian Brandt of the American Farmland Trust and Mark Kaiser of Kaiser and Associates, an environmental science and engineering firm. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Feel free to contact me. Here's my information right here, and let's move on to some questions um, facilitated by our own Jeff Chisinski. Hello. Um, got a few questions coming in, but it seems that people are a bit shy. Keep writing as I'm, as I'm going through some of these. Um, how do you think that the National Organic Pro Program's uh, current allowance for hydroponics uh, uh, or, or what they call substrate non-soil growing methods will affect their potential in ecosystem services markets. Is that a negative or a positive, do you think? Um, so, you know, that's going to really depend on who you ask. There is a segment of those that work in organics that don't believe that um, aquaponics and hydroponics should be considered organic. Um, I think that's why you're seeing new certifications like the Regenerative Organic Program pop up. Um, so they're based on soil. You know, I, I would like to see a kind of life cycle assessment um, of a hydroponics or an aquaponics farm because, you know, I, I'm aware of the, the um, claims that you're going to be saving lots of water, um, which is huge, you know, especially like dry regions here in Texas. And I think hydroponics and aquaponics can serve um, really good uses in areas that are food deserts or in urban areas. Um, but I think, you know, I've seen a lot of systems and actually worked in systems that use a lot of styrofoam. You know, what's the environmental degradation cost of that? And, um, so I think for hydroponics and aquaponics to play a role in ecosystem service markets, something like that would have to happen. Um, and that's kind of my opinion. And, you know, I think um, there's also other factors such as how much, you know, a lot of times you have to put in implements like phosphorus and nitrogen into the system. What is the cost of mining those um, versus a really healthy soil that has 
really good functioning nutrient cycling. Um, I think those are all questions that need to be asked. Um, but I'm not sure how it's going to impact them, but I think some that's kind of the first step. Thanks. Um, in terms of the ESMC and Indigo, how are they dealing? You noticed that they deal with additionality, but how are they dealing with the issue of permanence? So I'm not really aware of Indigo yet. Um, there has been a ton that has come out on them. I know the ESMC from my conversations, I believe are going to be operating on 10 year contracts. So there's always an option to renew after 10 years. So that saves you from getting into like some 50 year contract um, that's, you know, you're stuck with for life, you know, I'm 30 years old and I'd be 80 by the time I'd be out of the contract. Um, I think that also gives opportunities for people who are renting land more and also gives you it may take a little while for you to like build up that um carbon and build up that soil and kind of get the train rolling like you need a little momentum sometimes so i think that 10-year number is actually pretty good and then you have an option to um after 10 years to get back into the program i guess the, the issue come hearing is that it's not that i mean at 10 years what happens if uh, i switch a bunch of practices my soil carbon increases the 10 years is up, I decide I don't like this anymore. I'm gonna plow it all up and all of that's long. So the permanence is really an issue of how do we make sure it is in fact permanently stored carbon since yeah. it was paid for. Definitely, yeah. And I think, you know, I'm not sure how they're gonna actually operate that. Um, but that is something that's worth bringing up to Debbie when she um, hosts that because yeah, as far as to your point, Jeff, I there is nothing, if you have a 10-year contract, I think you're free to do whatever you want with your land after that 10 years. Um, so yeah, you could move to pile it up or sell it off to make a subdivision. So that is a, a really valid point. Uh, someone also mentioned that the, uh, I guess, an emerging ecosystem market uh, is Nori. Do you know anything about Nori and why wasn't it in the presentation? Maybe it's somebody from Nori. <laughs> um, so I have heard of Nori. Um, let's see. I'm trying to remember what actually Nori is. I actually is escaping my memory. Um, so I'm sorry I left you out if you're a person from Nori. Um, as a, I know I'm supposed to ask the questions, but Nori is a one that uh, it's a kind of a, it's a private one set up and it's actually using a blockchain technology to in its process of verification and, transparency. It is more orientated towards providing the system of tracking, I believe. Just okay. Because I knew that from Soy Con. <laughs> but yeah. I thought you might have too. Yeah, okay. Yeah. That sounds familiar. Yeah, that one that one was escaping me. I'm sorry I didn't include you in the presentation. Yeah, all right. As a producer, how does one determine what is fair and acceptable payment rate for the carbon credit? Um, so depending on where you are and what program you're in, it's going to be determined by a market value. And I think to determine what is fair and worth your time, you need to run some different scenarios and um, maybe see what kind of carbon you're able to sequester. You know, the amount of payment you're going to get is really going to depend on the size of your land, your carbon sequestration potential, and things like that. Um, so if it's like a direct payment or not a direct payment like a voluntary program i think you have to basically almost plug it into your cost and basically your um, expenditures and like your income like you would like a business plan um and then for the price you know the fairness of a cap and trade market it's kind of not up to you unfortunately what you're going to be getting so i think you have to look at how much you're going to be spending and if that market is going to allow you to get uh, things like EQIP or CSP funding, and then um, I think go from there. I think you have to kind of do basically like, a, you know, I'm a fan of whole farm planning and whole farm accounting, and I think you have to put that into your management plan. Sorry, I missed that. Could you say it again, please? Oops, sorry, I guess. Uh, oh, Siri, Siri in the distance. <laughs> Siri wants to answer the question. <laughs> Anyway, um, these are kind of related. Um, one is what is the acreage limitation for participation? And is there kind of a rule of thumb 
for a minimum size of farm to participate. In other words, I guess, does it make sense for a smaller farm to pursue any of these programs? Ecosystem services, I believe. Yeah. Um... So, you know, I have seen numbers thrown around like 5,000 acres um, for participation, which is pretty big. Um, you know, we work with some farmers that have 15,000 acres. Um, and then there's lots of ranches that are involved. I think for smaller farmers and ranchers, I really think EQIP and certification programs and um, conservation easements are a better path until you can get involved in programs that allow for stacking, you know, so you can get habitat, um, water quality and carbon markets. And then I think aggregation is also important. Um, you know, the average small farmer and rancher just for the cost of verification of soil testing for a lot of these right now, isn't gonna be really that feasible. Here's the bit maybe, is the payments for ecosystem services program a disincentive for the polluters and quote destroyers of wildlife habitats to actually stop their polluting and destructive practices. So that's a really fair point. And um, in some cases, I think yes, it depends on how stringent, you know, if it's a cap and trade, how stringent are those caps? And you know, basically we're reducing pollution in one space, but we could be reducing pollution in both. And you know, it does allow um for them to continue to pollute at a normal level um and it may be more it may be worse than nitrogen and phosphorus runoff i mean if we're talking about runoffs from like a lithium mine is that i think accounting for is that more destructive than runoff from a farm and i think that's something that um deserves looking at and considering when we the governments are developing these programs what about, uh, I think this meaning, what about permaculture? I guess because of your background is, do you think the adoption of a permaculture system would work in an ecosystem market? So, you know, I may be a bit of a bad permaculturist because I've used permaculture as kind of a tool bag that includes all, a lot of the practices I was talking about. You know, when I worked at the Permaculture Research Institute, we did a, just about all of those things I mentioned. Um, so if we're talking about maybe the inclusion of like berms and swales um, and like landscape earthworks, you know, the, that would be possibly included in, um, you know, uh, a payment for ecosystem service program, especially when we're talking about water quality or maybe carbon sequestration, because a lot of times you plant trees on those berms and swales. Um, and there are NRCS standards, which you have to kind of tinker with and, um, massage, but that allow for the implementation of berms and swales. Um, it also depends on the scale of that permaculture farm. Uh, again, leading back to an earlier question. Um, another one is um, the idea of, of why the Chicago climate exchange. Uh, you suggested it was a supply and demand issue, but others have suggested that it might be due to the quality of the credits provided. In other words, they weren't real projects. They weren't really sequestering carbon. And that, once that was become known, then the efficacy of the market caused the collapse. Do you think that that could repeat itself in history? Uh, definitely. I definitely think that could repeat itself. And that is an issue with it, um, with the carbon, the Chicago one. And I know it was also a voluntary market. So you have people buying like not fantastic credits and you know I think that is something that is concerning and that it's not actually you know carbon that is sequestered I do think that especially comes up when I you know remote sensing and things like that um, or then you know cutting corners on soil testing to make it cheaper um, are issues that are concerning for sure um, I think I think we could wrap it up unless there's some, I haven't seen any new ones right now. Um, oh, well, here's one, one of my favorite topics. <laughs> Are there payments for biochar applications to soil? So I know California has some grant programs for biochar and that, and I have seen some uh, NRCS practices for biochar. It was under, I think, uh, woodland 
uh, mitigation or woodland waste use. I can't remember the exact terminology for it, um, but you know there weren't any ecosystem service markets directly talking about carbon markets, especially a lot of conversations I have. But I think that's something that um, merits looking at, you know, with, uh, especially when we're dealing with forestry waste or things like that. Um, so no, I don't know any for specific eco ecosystem service markets that are paying for biochar. Uh, and one more just came in. I have funded research using something called iTree-Eco to measure eco services. Does anyone else or do you know of this as a method of measuring iTree? So I am not aware of anyone using iTree-Eco. There is a um, so the city of Austin is paying a nonprofit based out of Austin called Tree Folks um, to plant trees in riparian areas along the Colorado River, which those of you who aren't Texan, that goes through the middle of uh, Austin there. And they actually are using a program um, to, that is similar, it's kind of modeling um, and taking like tree growth inventory for, from those trees that are planted in the riparian. And um, that is also part of the floodplain mitigation because city of Austin and Central Texas has insane uh, flash floods. I've lived through like two millennium floods, um, 2000 year floods. And I know that is partially produced through city forest credits, which is out of, I believe, Seattle. And I think that's maybe a proprietary software they use. I can't remember the name of the actual software they're using but it using satellite imagery they can model like the crown growth and then based off the type of tree make estimates all uh, make estimates also about the uh, trunk growth and then make a measurement for carbon sequestered carbon se sequestered so it is a bit of a, a model that is being used i guess that wraps it up colin all right well thank you all so much and uh feel free to contact me if y'all need anything else and look out for part two and part three Thanks, everybody. Bye.